Well, Camille asked me to give an explanation, uh, in her words, demystify the information of the uh, indictment. And uh, I agreed to do that, but I'm also going to give a closing remark on each side. So I, after I'm done explaining the indictment, which may take half an hour, hopefully less, uh, I will then give a closing as if I were Donald Trump's lawyer. And then after I'm done with that, I will give a closing as if I were the prosecution lawyer. And after that, everybody will be happy. <laughs> and so my whole performance will not be as smooth as it would have been 10 years ago when I was still practicing law, but I think uh, it won't stop me from getting the uh, words across, even though at times it may distract you from what I'm saying. I hope you'll be able to pay attention to everything I'm saying and pretty much ignore the shaking that the Parkinson's can cause. So, okay, the indictment. The indictment was handed down by a federal grand jury. What does it say? Well, it's like the main part of it is 44 pages long. I've condensed it by eliminating many of the paragraphs. I've condensed some of the paragraphs that I've left in. Uh, so, I'm not quoting everything exactly word for word. Um, don't hold me, don't be critical because I changed one word to uh, summarize 10 words or whatever. So this is a summary, not a word for word version of it. Well, we'll start early on. Paragraph three, this is the allegation. This is what the grand jury said. The classified documents Trump stored in his boxes included information regarding defense and weapons capabilities of both the United States and foreign nations and the United States nuclear programs. Disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States. There it is. At noon on January 20, 2021, Trump ceased to be president. As he departed the White House, Trump moved scores of boxes, many of which contained classified documents to Mar-a-Lago. Trump was not authorized to possess or retain those classified documents. Now, I, I will explain that there can be two types of indictments. One that just lays out the charges, and then there's what in slang is called a speaking indictment, where the indictment includes a lot of the factual information, the background information. Well, this is a speaking indictment. So the first 15, 20 minutes of what I'm going to be uh, telling you about the indictment was not really necessary. But the government puts it in sometimes to explain why these charges are so justified. So this is a speaking <coughs> indictment, and I'll get to the charges later. This is the background information. Paragraph 5. Mar-a-Lago was an active social club which between January 2021 and August 22 hosted events for tens of thousands of members and guests. After Trump's presidency, Mar-a-Lago was not an authorized location for the storage, possession, review, display, or even discussion of classified documents. Nevertheless, Trump stored boxes containing classified documents in various locations at Mar-a-Lago. 
including, and some of you may have seen some pictures, in a ballroom, a bathroom, etc. On two occasions in 2021, Trump showed classified documents to other people. One, in July 21, at the Bedminster Club, that's in New Jersey, there was an audio recorded meeting with a writer, a publisher, and two members of his staff. None of them. None of whom had security clearance. So Trump showed them a plan of attack, his words, that Trump said was prepared for him by the Department of Defense and a senior military official. He said this was highly confidential and secret. He also said, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I, can you still hear me? Yes. yes. Now I can. As president, I could have declassified it. Now I can, you know. But this is still a secret. In August or September of 21 at the Bedminster Club, Trump showed a representative of his political action committee who did not possess security clearance, a classified map related to a military operation and told the representative that he should not be showing it to the representative and that the representative should not get too close. A federal grand jury investigation began in April 22. The grand jury issued a subpoena requiring Trump to turn over all documents with classification markings. Trump then attempted to obstruct this by suggesting that his attorney falsely represented to the FBI and grand jury that Trump did not have documents called for by the grand jury subpoena. The, by directing co-defendant Waltine Nauta, there was only one co-defendant in this case, and that's Nauta. By directing Nauta to move boxes of documents to conceal them from Trump's attorney, from the FBI and the grand jury. So they're suggesting, alleging, that he wanted not only to conceal it from the FBI and the grand jury, but from his own attorney. And also by suggesting that his attorney hide or destroy documents called for by the subpoena. He had multiple attorneys. I think in the indictment they referred to attorney one, attorney two, attorney three. Also, by providing to the FBI and grand jury just some of the documents called for by the subpoena while claiming that he was cooperating fully. Also, by causing a certification to be submitted to the FBI and the grand jury, falsely representing that all documents called for by the grand jury subpoena had been produced. All the while, Trump knowing in fact not all such documents had been produced. As a result of Trump's retention of classified documents after his presidency and refusal to return them, hundreds of classified documents were not recovered by the United States government until 2022 by the following method. On January 17, 22, nearly one year after Trump left office and after months of demands by the National Archives and Records Administration, sometimes called NARA, or I call them also the archives or archivists, Trump provided only 15 boxes. On June 3, five months later, in response to a grand jury subpoena, Trump provided 38 more classified documents. 
on August 8, 22, pursuant to a court-authorized search warrant, the FBI recovered from Trump's office and a storage room at Mar-a-Lago 102 more classified documents. As a candidate for President of the United States, this was when he was running, Trump made the following public statements, among others, about classified information. Now, let me add that I think it's fair to say that the government put this kind of stuff in the indictment to show that Trump had full knowledge of the seriousness of keeping top secret documents secret and that he would not be able to claim ignorance or, you know, just didn't think it was that important. So the government put in these allegations of fact. And again, at this point, everything in here is an allegation, only an allegation. So it includes quoting Trump from August of 2016 during his campaign. In my administration, I'm going to enforce all laws concerning the protection of classified information. No one will be above the law. In September 16, Trump said, we also need to fight this battle by collecting intelligence and then protecting, protecting our classified secrets. We can't have someone in the Oval Office who doesn't understand the meaning of the word confidential or classified. And then the indictment was even three more dates upon when he made speeches similar to that. And then as president, they also list what he said, something similar to this when he was president in 2018. As head of the executive branch and commander in chief, I have a unique constitutional responsibility to protect classified information by controlling access to it. More broadly, the issue of a former, and they retracted here, they don't give the guy's name out to the public. <coughs> anyway, about some security, some guy's security killers raises larger questions about the practice of former officials maintaining access to our nation's most sensitive secrets long after their time in government has ended. And you're forgiven if you're thinking that government stuck that in there for irony as well as uh, <laughs> indicating Trump's knowledge. Such access, this is Trump speaking, such access is particularly inappropriate when former officials have transitioned into highly partisan positions and seek to use real or perceived access the sensitive information to validate their political attacks. Any access granted to our nation's secrets should be in furtherance of national, not personal, interests. Yeah. <clears throat> in January of 21, while he was preparing to leave the White House, Trump was personally involved in moving boxes from the White House to Mar-a-Lago. That's their allegation. <clears throat> On December 7, 21, this is well after he left office, Nauta, the co-defendant, remember Nauta, found several of Trump's boxes fallen over and their contents spilled onto the floor of the storage room and he took some pictures. In one of the pictures, you can actually see a document identified that's mentioned elsewhere in the indictment. In May of 21, Trump caused some of his boxes to be brought to his summer residence at Bedminster. The indictment repeatedly mentions some of this stuff. 
in July 21, when he was no longer president, Trump gave an interview at Bedminster with a publisher in connection with a book. Other people attended as well. Before the interview, this explains this here, before the interview, there had been media reports that the chairman of the Joint Steam Chiefs, Mark Milley, had claimed that Trump was thinking about invading Iran. And that upset Trump. So Trump had a session here with these other people, and he wanted to tell them about how he found, I'm summarizing what's in the indictment here, how he found a document that Milley himself had prepared during his administration, and it was a plan on how to attack Iran. So here Milley had been quoted in the press as saying, in condemning fashion, that Trump was thinking about invading Iran. And now Trump sees this document where Milley had actually worked out a plan to invade Iran. So they quote Trump a lot on how he reacted. Look what I found. This was Milley's plan of attack. Read it. Get the significance of that? <laughs> this was his plan of attack. Read it. It's interesting. Later in this interview, Trump engaged in the following exchange. He said, I wanted to attack. Isn't it amazing? I have a big pile of papers. This thing came up. Look, this was him. This was him. The Defense Department of him. And they even quote from the transcript here, because it was being recorded. Other people, the writer says, wow, Trump. We looked at some, this was him. This wasn't done by me, this was him. All sorts of stuff, pages long. Look, Stafford, hmm, Trump. Wait a minute, let's see here, Stafford, <laughs> yeah. Trump, I just found, isn't that amazing? This totally wins my case, you know? <laughs> Stafford, mm, Trump. Except it is like highly confidential. Stafford, yeah. <laughs> they have laughter in the transfer. Trump, secret. This is secret information. Look, look at this. <laughs> Trump, by the way, isn't this incredible? Stafford, yeah. <coughs> Trump, I was just thinking, because we were talking about it, and you know, he said he wanted to attack Iran, and what? Stafford, you did. This was Trump, this is done by the military and given to me. Oh, well, maybe we can declassify it. Yeah, figure out. See, Trump, see, as president, I could have declassified it. Stafford, yeah. <laughs> the Stafford laughs a lot at Trump's jokes. <laughs> <coughs> Trump, now I can. I can declassify it, but this is a secret. Stafford, yeah. <laughs> now we have a problem. Trump, isn't that interesting? <coughs> at the time of that exchange, the writer, the publisher, and Trump's Staff members who were there did not have security clearances. In August or September of 21, when he was no longer president, Trump again was at Bedminster and he met with a representative of his political action committee. Not a government person who was uh, authorized to see security stuff. Trump showed him a classified map of another country. And he said, I should not be showing this map to you, and don't get too close. 
On February 16th, 2017, we've been in office like a month. Four years before the disclosures of classified information set forth above, Trump had said at a press conference, he was talking about, and the first thing I heard of when I heard about this, a security leak, how does the press get this information that's classified? How do they do it? <coughs> you know why? Because it's an illegal process and the press should be ashamed of themselves. More importantly, the people that gave out the information to the press should be ashamed of themselves. Really ashamed. I, I have to think the government attorneys were enjoying writing that. <laughs> On May 23 of 22, you've got to keep these years straight. He's well out of office now met with two of his lawyers and they told Trump that they needed to search for documents in response to the subpoena and that they'd have to provide a certification that they were all supplied. Trump said, I don't want anybody looking. I don't want anybody looking through my boxes. I really don't. I don't want you looking through my boxes. Well, what if we, what happens if we just don't respond at all? Or don't play ball with it? Again. Wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? Well look, isn't it better if there are no documents? Now you may be wondering, wait a minute, how do they know this? They're getting natural, you know, like quotes. He's meeting with his two lawyers. Well, I think one of the lawyers ratted him out. <laughs> um, and how can that be? Isn't a conversation between a lawyer and his client confidential? Well, it's not. Not if uh, the client is trying to pull off a crime. He can talk in full confidence about a past crime and how it could be defended. But if a client starts proposing a future crime, that's not covered by uh, an attorney-client privilege and the lawyer would be required, uh, if subpoenaed, et cetera, to uh, disclose the nature of any of those conversations. So it doesn't say that's how they know but I think it's pretty obvious that's how they know because they got information from the one lawyer. Not that he was happy to do it, but he didn't have a choice. Uh, okay, we're getting towards the end here. Trump and the one attorney then discussed what to do with the red weld folder. The red weld folder is one of the dark red folders that flow over, they have a flap and everything, and uh, contains, it holds a lot of documents, like a big file. And so it was decided that the one Trump attorney should take it to his hotel room and put it in a safe there uh, before he hands them over to the government the next day. But at the end of that conversation, Trump indicated to the lawyer that you should remove anything that's really bad in there. <laughs> He's having his own lawyer give the stuff to the company and have your final, but remove anything that's really bad. Okay. The next day on June 3, the lawyer does hand over that and another lawyer did the certification, certifying basically that this is well. I guess you can still hear me, right? Despite the static. Okay. Uh, 
Um, so they had a third lawyer do the certification that this is all there is. And she, it was a female lawyer they conned into this. A diligent search was conducted of the boxes that were moved from the White House to Florida. This search was conducted after receipt of the subpoena in order to locate any and all documents that are responsive to the subpoena. Any and all responsive documents accompany this certification. Well, this part of the in indictment concludes by saying, these statements were false because among other reasons, Trump had directed not to, to move boxes before Trump's attorney won review so that many boxes were not searched <coughs> and many documents responsive to the subpoena could not be found and were not found. In July 22, the FBI and the grand jury obtained and reviewed surveillance video from mar a showing the movement of the boxes that had previously been mentioned. Okay, that's the speaking part of the speaking indictment. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the actual charges because they're repetitive a lot. Let me just say that counts one to 31 are all the same charge willful retention of national defense information. That's the title of the section. Willful retention of national defense information. It doesn't say top secret documents, classified documents, national defense information. Willful retention of On or about the date set forth, etc., etc., Trump having unauthorized possession of, access to, and control over the documents, did willfully retain these documents and failed to deliver them to the employee of the United States entitled to receive them. That is, Trump, without authorization, retained at Mar-a-Lago documents relating to the national defense, including the following. And then the 31 counts this 31 documents. I'll just mention the first one as an example. Count one, a May 3, 2018, this is when he was president, intelligence briefing regarding various foreign countries. Then it goes on all through the next 30 additional counts naming documents, not giving a lot of detail, but mentioning that they involve such things as military plans, military capabilities, nuclear weapons, terrorism, terrorism etc. Then there's six more counts against Trump. And I'll just briefly mention their title. And they sound similar. You'll notice this. Conspiracy to obstruct justice, withholding a document or record, corruptly concealing a document or record, concealing a document in a federal investigation, scheme to conceal, count 37, the last one, false statements and representations. They do sound sort of similar, you gotta admit that. Um, but there's fine distinctions, and that's the way the law is. There's, there's not hundreds of different criminal offenses, there's thousands, you know? Very fine distinction. If you and another person are playing in a crime and you're gonna commit it, but then you tell a third, that's one crime, you tell a third person to do something that's part of it, well, that's a whole nother one because now you, you're not just doing it with your buddy, now you've sucked another person into it. So that's a whole nother one. And on and on and on. So there's lots of variations. And Trump is charged with six different of those that sound similar, but they're actually different. Well, they haven't 
concluding paragraph, the statements and representations set forth were false, and Trump knew, because Trump had directed that boxes be removed from the storage room before Trump Attorney One conducted the search. <coughs> Who's over the stuff I can so That's the end of explaining the indictment. Now I'm, now I'm Trump's lawyer. And let me just explain that um, in between the indictment and going to trial, there can be, and there usually are, pretrial motions more often filed by the defense, but sometimes by the prosecution. What kind of motion? Well, it could be a motion for discovery, even though they laid out a lot in the indictment. There's probably a lot more, you can be sure. And the government will usually hand over, without any motions, a lot of discovery. Often all of it, all that could possibly be given. But nevertheless, the defense, and I suspect they will, uh, because it takes time, file a motion for discovery to make, have the court order the prosecution to hand over even more documents and more documents and more documents, more names. And one of the things that can be saying justifies asking for all this is because we want to file a motion to dismiss for selective prosecution. They want to find in there enough information, maybe somebody's name, and they can then make a case that, ah, Trump is being singled out for selective prosecution, and then we can file another pretrial motion, a motion to dismiss for selective prosecution after they've gotten the discovery. Well, if the court orders discovery and the defense isn't satisfied, maybe they'll file another pretrial motion, a motion to dismiss for denial, denial of full discovery. And in a case with top, dealing with top secret documents, that could be the case, they may think, because the government maybe doesn't want to give discovery for everything, that's top secret. And so they'll file a motion to deny, dismiss the case because you didn't give us full discovery. Another motion, it's a motion to suppress evidence. The biggest piece of evidence, of course, would be what was seized at Mar-a-Lago. So they could file a motion to suppress all that was seized there. And the basis for that would be, oh, the search warrant was bad. There was a mistake of fact here, or somebody lied, whatever. Anyway, that's the kind of motion they could file. I'm not saying it's justified or not. I don't know. Uh, they could also try to suppress <clears throat> statements, for example, from Trump's lawyer. Uh, I think it's Evan Corker the guy who spilled the beans regarding those private conversations with Trump. So if you can suppress all those statements that Trump made to his lawyer, I don't know how he can do it, but it's possible they could file a motion and try anyway. Uh, and, but there's no limit on the type of pretrial motion that can be filed. Uh, not like a list and you can only choose from these 10 types of motions. There could be a unique motion. If I were representing Trump, one that I might consider would be a motion to dismiss in the interest of national security. Just say, there's a lot of top secret stuff here and we realize it, but that doesn't mean the defendant is entitled to any fewer of its constitutional rights. He's entitled to them, so there's a conflict between maintaining national security and giving the defendant all his rights. How can we resolve this? 
Do we compromise national security? No. Do we compromise the defendant's constitutional trial rights? No, can't do that. Okay, what's left? You have to dismiss the charges, as reluctant as we all are, right? I hate to see it, you say, but that's the only solution is to drop the charges because there's such a big conflict. So that's the kind of unique motion that might be filed. Okay, closing time. You've heard all the evidence. You're all jurors now, right? You're all jurors. So uh, I never gave a closing in all my many, many jury trials. I never gave a closing sitting down. So, so I, I gave, I'm going to do my best to pretend I'm back in my working years and give a closing standing up despite my problems, okay? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Why are you here? Have you thought about that? Why are you here? Twelve of you. Oh, four alternates here. We have a judge right here who's very learned in the law and could hear all this evidence and decide. So why are you here? Well, because in this country, we feel that it's better to have 12 people who have to be convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of somebody's guilt before we find them guilty. Not just one person, even though that one person is a learned judge, and a very good judge at that. <laughs> But it counts more, it's more important to have 12 people. You all heard the same evidence? Yeah. So it's not like we have 12 witnesses coming in from different parts of the city to tell what happened. <coughs> you all heard exactly the same evidence. But yet we want 12 of you to have to agree that he should not be convicted until we all agree we're satisfied beyond a reasonable doubt of his guilt. So you're not expected to agree. That's why there's 12 of you. You don't have to. You can feel one way, she can feel another way, and it's all legitimate. You don't have to agree. Now, what are you going to do in the jury room? You're going to deliberate and discuss the evidence. When you do that, use your common sense. Yeah, not just go by the technical word-by-word -word meaning of a criminal offense, but what was, it in, what was its intent? What was the purpose of that criminal statute. And think about, you know, a president has tremendous power. Probably more power than just about anybody else on earth, you know? Commander in chief, has the nuclear codes, all sorts of power. Entrusted with the top, top secrets, right? Does he suddenly become a national risk on January 20th at noon when he's no longer president? No. He's the same person. He was entrusted with all these documents. He's not president now. Now he doesn't have the authority to declassify the documents, but is he any more of a risk can, is he supposed to wipe his memory of all the secret stuff he knows? No. Can't do it. So look at the intent.
to see if it was meant to cover such a thing. You know, we all agree it's illegal to abuse a child. It would be terrible. But should that include if you give a light spank on the butt of your four-year-old for having thrown something at his little sister? No. Was there technically an assault? Yes. Was the statutes that prohibit physical abuse of a child, even your own child, was the purpose of that statute to prevent that spank on the butt? No. Likewise, we all agree, I think, that it's proper to have speed limits on our highways, right? What about if somebody's speeding one or two miles an hour over the limit? What then? Is that something that the intent of the law is there to prosecute? Should we prosecute someone for going one or two miles an hour over the speed limit? We know the answer to that, I think. Probably none of us have heard of anybody getting a ticket for going one or two miles an hour over the limit. <clears throat> and it doesn't matter how much evidence they have that he went one mile an hour over the limit. If there were, if there was a troopers training day and they had 10 troopers with 10 radar guns and they all agree that he was doing one mile an hour over the limit, does that change the nature of the offense despite how much evidence they have? Evidence upon evidence, trooper after trooper coming and testifying. It doesn't change the fact that it was such a minor offense, it wasn't the intent to make it criminal in an offense. So it doesn't matter how much evidence you have of an insignificant violation, it's still an insignificant violation with no repercussions. Let me bring you your attention to the indictment itself. Paragraph three, early on. And you may see the indictment, the judge may give it to you. The unauthorized disclosure of these classified documents could put at risk the national security of the United States. Huh, does that sound bad at first? But look at it. There is no claim that Trump did damage national security. It says the documents could put at risk. No, it doesn't even say he put at risk national security. It went one step lower yet. The documents could, could, what's that mean? Well, might, might not, might not put at risk. Could put at risk, that's pretty low. Is that proof beyond a reasonable doubt that he endangered the American defense, the American country? And if, it, if he didn't, should we be here? Should we even be thinking about convicting a man when the most they can say is, well, the way he handled the documents could put at risk the security. I think there's reasonable doubt right there. Right there, and you can all find reasonable doubt. Oh, wait a minute, what is reasonable doubt? The judge will explain it. Let me talk a little bit about it. 
the judges will often tell you reasonable doubt is a doubt that will cause you to hesitate in acting in a matter of importance to yourself. Not that will stop you from acting, but will cause you to hesitate in acting in a matter of importance to yourself. An example would be, especially for you people from up north like me, it's winter time and your 10 year old child or children want to go out ice skating. And you know it's been frozen, been below zero four nights in a row. So you take them down to the lake, maybe it's a mile across, and you see lots of skaters. You see snowmobilers, you see a couple ice fishermen. You have no doubt at all. You let your kids out and they skate. But what about the next week? Now, the coldest it's been in recent nights was 32. And it got up to 50 some days. Your kids want to go skating again. Again, you go down to the lake. And now you see some skaters, no snowmobilers, no ice fishermen. I hesitate. It's a matter of importance to me. It may well be very safe for them to skate. In fact, okay, have a good time. I'll pick you up at three o'clock. But if that doubt causes you to hesitate, then you were not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt. You may have done the right thing and let them skate. But were you convinced beyond a reasonable <coughs> doubt? No, because you hesitated. There was a basis that warmer weather, the lack of the snowmobilers, the lack of so many skaters, a reasonable doubt. And let me point out one part that I'm sure the prosecution will mention. Remember the map, that classified map encounter, where my client said, it's still secret. Don't get too close. Well, they want to use that against them. I suggest you can see that as reasonable doubt of his guilt right there. Is he putting America's security at risk? So there's a map on the table. You know, if you don't get close, you can't do anything. There's no testimony that that other guy was a spy. No testimony that he had a camera and took a picture. Could he have seen it? Well, Trump said, don't get too close. So if you don't get close to a map, no harm, no foul. It shows that even though he was no longer president, my client was still acting to prevent any actual damage to our security. <coughs> was there some risk? Could, maybe, risk, risk is not certainty of damage, reasonable doubt. And finally, one thing you should be clear about. If you have that reasonable doubt, don't think that it gives you permission to vote not guilty in that jury room. No, if you have a reasonable doubt, you are required to vote not guilty.
by the oath you took and by the instructions the court will give you, if you have that reasonable doubt, you have an obligation under our law to vote not guilty. Thank you. Keep in mind, the reason Trump is in trouble is not because he took documents, not at all. It's because he declined to return them and he left them unsecured. That's it. He was even subpoenaed. By law, had to, again. He only returned some documents, breaking the law. The documents, the only crimes he's charged with, pertain to documents that were obtained by the FBI when they executed the search warrant. Neither Pence, nor Biden, nor Trump are charged <clears throat> regarding documents they had returned to the archives. No selective prosecution there. Treated the same, all three of them, regarding documents that were returned. Trump is only charged with documents he refused to return. The defense also claims politics. I don't know, did he use the word witch hunt at one point? He certainly implied politics at work here. Well, let me explain. There is one section in the code concerning concealment or removal of the documents that would have prevented, if he were convicted, would have prevented Trump from being convicted, from being ever serving as an employee of the government again, including as president. 18 U.S. Code 2071. Concealment or removal by someone having custody of those documents. That statute is even mentioned in the search warrant. But we did not charge him with that. If this had been political and we were out for political games, he could easily have been charged. And the, the difference is that if you mention, if, if you commit a crime like concealing, lying about the documents you shouldn't have, that's one thing. But if you're a government employee and you do any part of that, any part of the chain of events committing that crime, then you're not to be trusted again to be a government employee. And that would have stopped Trump if he were convicted of it. But we didn't even charge him with it. So, so much for claiming this is all politics. And I hope by the time I'm done summarizing here that you can see there's just so much evidence, my Lord, to claim that it's politics is outrageous and blinding yourself to the evidence. Let me be clear, you cannot <clears throat> use the fact that Mr. Trump did not testify against him. He has the right to remain silent, does not have to testify. The burden is on the government to prove him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt, and you can't use his silence at trial against him. But you can consider Mr. Trump's out-of-court statements, and you've heard witnesses here testify to things that Mr. Trump has said prior to this trial. A lot of them contradict each other. 
His excuses ranged wide. Just one. Trump has said that his document handling was justified under the Presidential Records Act. That is so not true. It is so easy to find out, to look up and see if anything of that is true. His lawyers never used it. But did Trump claim that on the outside as an excuse? I'm entitled to do it by the Presidential Records Act? He's not. Here's what it says. The United States shall reserve and retain complete ownership, possession, and control of presidential records. <coughs> it says a lot more, but that's it. The government owns the records. At 12.01 on January 20th, Trump had no right to any of them. Even while he was president, listen to this, what this record says, what the presidential record says. Even during the president's term of office, the president may only dispose of those president, presidential records that no longer have administrative, historical, informational, or evidentiary value if, if the archivist agrees. So the Presidential Records Act says even when he was president, he couldn't get rid of those documents unless the archivist agrees. So forget that excuse. You've heard it a lot, I'm sure. <coughs> Trump also made the excuse that, well, and he said this on TV, that the Presidential Records Act says we should can discuss this, negotiate, we're going to talk. And if you don't reach an agreement, you're going to continue to talk. That's what he said. You talk, you negotiate, you make a deal. That's what he said on national TV. <clears throat> he was hoping to make a deal I got dozens and dozens and dozens of boxes of stuff and so many documents, and I can make a deal, give some back to make a deal, and I'll keep some. But that's not the law. There is absolutely nothing in the law that gives the archives any permission to negotiate or make any deal. Those documents are all the government's. He's just making that stuff up. What was another excuse? Oh, they could have had it any time they wanted. And that includes long ago. All they had to do was ask. <laughs> Nara had asked for over a year. And then a subpoena even in May of 22. And then in June, he submits certification that there's nothing more left, nothing to ask for. Yet two months after that, he says, all you had to do was ask. Well, you just told me there's nothing left. And now you're saying I should have asked. Oh. Another one of his excuses, which you may have heard, number in August. Number one, it was all declassified. Well, you heard testimony here. We covered that. We covered it. We brought in government witnesses who testified that they searched all possible sources, found no order by Trump or anyone else declassifying all those documents or having any standing order to declassify because he took it out of the White House, that it's automatic. There's no such order, no such order, and that's undenied. No testimony here in court that there was such an order.
But one more thing about that. What if they were declassified? Well, first of all, I wouldn't say much about the judgment of our president if he's declassifying all those documents about nuclear weapons and foreign nations and everything. But more importantly, it doesn't matter to you and your job here because he's not charged with violations regarding only classified documents. He's charged those first 31 counts, remember? Those first 31 counts, documents related to national defense. Classified or not, doesn't matter. Concealing from the grand jury, those other counts, etc. Doesn't matter if they're classified or not. So it's all a smoke screen. The fact that he says, oh, I declassified them all when I left. Irrelevant to these charges. One of his last excuses, August of 22, the FBI or the Justice Department might have planted the evidence. <laughs> yeah, might have planted the evidence. The evidence that you're saying you declassified <laughs> when you brought it to the, to Mar-a-Lago, huh? Okay. Well, our time should be up. I've got a lot more to argue. I don't know. Let me just have a show of hands. How many would like to me to make a comment or ask a question? Raise your hand. Okay, a few, not that many. So I'm gonna go over my time limit. I wanted to reserve the last half hour for comments and questions, but there's not that many of you. So I'm going to continue on with my closing for a little bit. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 <laughs> uncontradicted. That's an important word here. There's a lot of uncontradicted evidence. And who has that uncontradicted evidence? We do. We presented it. Not the defendant. Our uncontradicted evidence, Trump personally participated in removing federal documents from the White House. Uncontradicted. For over a year, he failed to return them. Uncontradicted. Thousands of members and guests were at Mar-a-Lago where he had these documents unsecured. That's uncontradicted. In July 21, Trump told people that a defense plan was highly confidential and secret. As president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still secret. What kind of judgment is that showing? Is he worried about breaking law or does he feel immune? The man is an idiot. <laughs> I didn't hear the joke, but I'll tell it later. Uh, in regard to the map, Trump said he should not be showing it. He knows. Okay, we don't have proof that the guy took a photo of it or that the guy passed information on to Putin. But the statutes that he's charged with violating don't require that. It requires that he put at risk, okay? That he risk this endangerment. He shouldn't have had that classified map out with anybody else even in the room, period. That's speeding by at least another three or four miles an hour over the limit, you know? Then he uncontradicted, uncontradicted that Trump suggested to his attorney to lie to the FBI and the grand jury 
that they did not have any more documents uncontradicted. I think we're up to 10 miles an hour over the limit now. <laughs> he told his co-defendant not to, to move boxes of documents to conceal them from Trump's own attorney, the FBI and the grand jury. Told him. That's why Nott is in trouble. Nott is the co-defendant. I think we may be up to 18 miles an hour. <laughs> Suggesting that his attorney hide or destroy the documents called for by the grand jury subpoena. That's uncontradicted that he said that. Right there. Okay? 20 miles an hour over the limit. <laughs> Causing a certification to the FBI and the grand jury that was false. And he knew it. He knew it was false. And we know it's ironic, you know, that some of the statements he made that you've heard testified to, that how high a standard he's going to hold everybody to in his administration and how important it is to keep classified documents secret and everything. I'm sure you remember all that. It was pretty entertaining, actually. So uh, I won't go over all that. But I will have to remind you of one conversation that was recorded. Look what I found. This was Millie's plan of attack. Read it. He actually said the words, read it. This wasn't done by me. This was him. All sorts of stuff, pages long. Look. Look, 25 miles an hour over the limit. <laughs> what happens if we just don't play ball with them? We don't respond. Talking to his lawyer. Soliciting criminal conduct on behalf of the lawyers as well. Wouldn't it be better if we just told them we don't have anything here? Well, look, isn't it better if there are no documents? You know, is that suggesting just maybe we should just burn them all? <laughs> 30 miles an hour over the limit. I'm saving you a lot of time here. <laughs> So ladies and gentlemen, the defendant's lawyer talked about a reasonable doubt, but let me make this clear. It can't be an imaginary doubt. It can't be a doubt that you would like to have because you would like a certain result. It can't be a doubt that you manufacture in your mind out of prejudice or bias, favoritism, it still has to be a real doubt, a reasonable doubt. Beyond a reasonable doubt means a real doubt. And I don't know how thick the ice was on that pond that second weekend, but we have presented to you with so much uncontradicted evidence again and again of all the offenses that he has committed. 
that really there's no reasonable doubt of his guilt in this case. Thank you. Judge, if I could. But... <laughs> that wasn't, that wasn't <laughs> yeah. 
Of course, yeah. I think the prosecution, my personal opinion, as Bill Sayre, the civilian, non-lawyer, I think Trump is clearly guilty. Sure, I'd rather be the prosecutor. It's a lot easier than defending somebody like Trump. You have to really work to defend Trump. If you have a uh, client, you're a defense attorney, you have a client that is difficult, doesn't follow instructions, has a tendency to talk perhaps too much to the press, how do you decide if you're going to actually represent them? And I know there's been difficulty trying to find attorneys to take this up, whether it's being paid or damage to your reputation. And as a defense attorney, do you pick and choose some of your clients if you find them not credible, or you find them too difficult, would you walk away instead of representing them? I've never walked away. I've always represented any, everybody who uh, requested my services. I had everything from shoplifting to first degree murder, death penalty cases. Um, you have to, when you're a defense lawyer, you have to value the American system of justice. And that is everybody's entitled to a defense. That doesn't mean you're entitled to a defense lawyer who's going to lie for you, who's going to put on perjured testimony or anything, no. But who will put on the best defense as the law and the rules of ethics allow. And that may be very limited, but nevertheless, within those limitations, as a defense lawyer, you represent your client, even if all you can do is try to get him life in prison instead of the death penalty, if that's what he wants. If he wants the death penalty, as happens sometimes, then after really reviewing with yourself and everything, his mental state and everything, you can still try to go along with what he wants. In my opinion, in my opinion. But it never happened. I was like, none of my clients ever got the death penalty. I'm from Philly, by the way, and I'm glad I never got to meet you at any point, but right here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you again for your time and presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, quick add before I ask you a question. Um, I, I've already said that when the facts are on your side, when the facts are against you, rather, you argue the law. When the law is against you, you argue the facts. The political against you, you find the table. Yes. Uh, your defense at the time was pretty much body on the table, I thought, so it was a good job. Uh, but the question is, the co-defendant, uh, Nada, do you think he's already gotten the speech? He's still decided to roll the dice, or is, he, is that still to come? They're in the flip. Well, he just had an arraignment yesterday, and he's still working closely with Trump. Yeah. So I suspect he hasn't flipped. Maybe he hasn't. He's just being uh, secretive about it. But, uh, you know, I don't know. And, Really, to me, it's not that important to know that st stuff. It's the facts we need to know how he'll flip or not flip in the end. I don't, I don't think it matters that much. They shouldn't offer him that greedy though. I don't know if they need him. To me, they have enough evidence without not to, on their side. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. That was just exceptional, and I enjoyed that a great deal. Uh, as you know, we're both members. We're in the Lawyers Club. And when I practiced law for over 30 years in Columbus, Ohio, uh, I found, and people may not, they might not like hearing this, but I found, encountered in my litigation experience, I was a civil lawyer, I represented usually plaintiffs, okay, people who had a complaint against somebody, not a criminal lawyer, okay, criminal defense lawyer. But I, I found there was judicial and jury hostility uh, to an illegal act that caused no harm. Okay. So regardless of what the law said, if it was no harm, no foul, uh, I found that there was judicial and jury hostility yeah, to you, conviction. What, you, may have, you may have picked out from my closing on behalf of Trump that that was sort of the main thing Yes. That in the end, it wasn't that big a foul because nothing got damaged and anything like that. So that that was the uh, main yeah. the main point. Yeah. yeah. It, was a, it was a great speech, great talk. Um, are there any boundaries on uh, uh, discovery? 
any you boundaries on discovery. In the beginning that they could use discovery to delay. Are yes. there any boundaries as to what they could ask for to be discovered? Well, I suppose if you ask for something totally outrageous, the judge would sanction the lawyer for having asked it. But uh, you, uh, you'd have to ask for something really outrageous to be sanctioned. So generally, the rule is no harm in asking, you know. Well, that was wonderful. I enjoyed it. I learned a lot of things. But I raised a question for me when you said that the subpoena that they had, there were still documents that were not found. Were any of those documents that were not found the ones, the map or the um, other documents that were mentioned in the um, counts? So if you had a list of a subpoena for certain documents, somebody must have said, hey, I saw this map. And that's how they, you know what I'm saying? Like, were there documents still that were on the subpoena that have not been found? And if so, were any of them? No, I don't think that the subpoena itself and the, um, the affidavit of probable cause on the search warrant That's has not been, been fully warrant. released. That, yeah. That's still secret, a lot of it. Uh, it's been partially released, but we don't know all the allegations in, this, in the affidavit uh, asking for the search warrant. Uh, so are there still some documents missing? I don't know. I think the general theme is, is that the uh, prosecution knew there were missing documents, even though they didn't know <coughs> exactly what the documents were. They got enough information, and just from the, uh, the video surveillance showing not to moving these boxes out of the storage room before, which, I mean, they got Trump's own video to incriminate, to show that, you know, boxes and boxes were moved and hidden from the lawyer who made the certification. So even though they might not know exactly what document was hidden, they know documents were hidden. And they know it because when they did the search warrant, they recovered 100 of them or whatever. So, at least those were hidden. Now, did he flush more down the toilet or something? Who knows? Well, I was just wondering about how they could um, they must have had they must have had something that someone said saw some documents, so they were looking for specific documents that were used in the evidence, no? I'm not sure I understand your question. I've got Ivan's grave. charges against Trump are potential charges with the Georgia uh, election and, and results and other things. Are they, are they uh, as rigorous or, or as likely to, to be uh, pushed forward as the... I, I would think so, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't have any inside information on that. Um, and your first question was? Well, they actually get an impartial jury. Oh, the impartial jury. Can well, throw the case out? I, I hear they're going to try to find some uh, missionaries <laughs> in, <laughs> in, 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 central, in Central Africa that have been there for five years. So, uh, you know, true? who haven't Isn't heard anything. That, that, that if they can't get an impartial jury, that, that is reason enough to discard the case. No, because you can, there's often trouble having an impartial jury. You may have to move the venue from one county to another or whatever. In this case, of course, it wouldn't matter too much because everybody in the country has heard about it. Uh, so you can't have a completely unknowledgeable jury. 
that does not mean they cannot be jurors with an open enough mind, okay? Somebody, probably every one of them, will come in leaning one way or the other. That shouldn't disqualify them from being a juror in the Trump case any more than a homicide case that made the front page news for weeks. Uh, you know, it's, you do the best you can. Some may be, and, and they all got past voir dire, which is questioning by the lawyers or the judge before trial to see if you're neutral enough. Okay, well, yeah, you had, but can you set aside those preconceived notions? Can you set aside those notions and base your decision only upon the evidence you hear in court? Yes, Your Honor. Or sometimes they'll say, no, Your Honor, I can't. Okay, your excuse. Uh, so, you know, in, in my closing, I tried to appeal to the jurors who would, might be inclined to be in Trump's favor, but they're the type who, if the evidence was 100%, they would go by their oath and vote guilty, you know? So you've got to, as a defense lawyer, give them some legitimate hook upon which they can hang their not guilty vote. So that's why I try to give enough reasoning under the law and using the facts such as, you know, don't get too close to the map, that they could hold on to those views as the important controlling things and in their mind justify, in their mind, the verdict that they wanted, which would be not guilty. So hopefully, you know, as a defense lawyer, you would say, hopefully you could raise uh, enough doubts in the minds of the ones who were leaning that way, that even though if you didn't mention that, they would vote guilty. But because you're the defense lawyer, you did give them this legal out. Hey, I said I would be impartial and everything, but the defense lawyer said A, B, and C. That's, that's good. Okay, I'm going to vote not guilty. You give them that that they can hang on to. That's, that's what you do. And it was all done ethically. I, hopefully you noticed in my closing for Trump, I didn't lie. You know, I didn't talk about fabricated evidence. I just talked about the law and tried to make arguments to make the most out of what little I had. I didn't say that. <laughs> you mentioned all kinds of uh, motions that would be filed that could uh, delay this thing on and on and on and on. Is there anything that the judge can do to speed things along uh, or anybody else to, to get it so it's like maybe done before the primaries? Yeah, the judge can order that all, all remaining motions shall be filed by, you know, September 15th or whatever. Uh, and then the judge may have to amend that when something else pops up on <coughs> September 14th. Oh, judge, you have to reconsider. We got this motion, you know. So, yeah, I think it's going to be tough. I don't think it's going to be tried this year. And, and in fact, if he's got good lawyers, it's going to be tough to get it tried by election in 24. I think it'll be very difficult to get him tried by the election in 24. Yeah, I suppose he's got really good lawyers, and so I sure hope that along, maybe no hope. Well, uh, Judge Cannon, the female lawyer he, that's on the case, was appointed by Trump, and she's already ruled in his favor on one big matter that was overturned by the Circuit Court of Appeals. So. He lucked out, and that was random draw. By random draw, he got a judge that he appointed, and then who favors Trump. I believe that uh, Attorney General Bill Barr said straight, Trump is toast. <laughs> and uh, I think our real problem is with the judge, Eileen. Uh, I think that. Uh, not having experience and uh, with such a uh, important case, uh, a whole bunch of things can go wrong. 
That's what I'm afraid of. Yes. Bill, thank you. I thought it was a great presentation. Uh, but the only presentation we really have is a practical matter with the indictment for the grand jury, which is just looking at probable cause. They're not looking at it guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, and I think they nicely spelled it out. I, in fact, I thought it was very interesting that they even published uh, national security information in the indictment and they complained about Closer to the mic, please. Oh. I thought that the indictment uh, published national security information and they complained about uh, Trump doing it. But aside from that, uh, count 11, by the way, I believe, I only read through it once very, very quickly, uh, doesn't even reference a classified document. They just didn't like the document. Or they thought, and I think you covered it nicely, when you said there was some documents that were just uh, proper defense information. But they actually were not even classified. Uh, but aside from that, I think the only person in the room who thinks that uh, this case will never come to trial. Uh, I think, uh, Bill, if both of you were working on this case, uh, that uh, indictment is a Christmas tree of discovery and constitutional issues, both on the, uh, the Records Act, the Espionage Act, uh, the collection of information, attorney-client privilege, work product, uh, the use of other agencies, uh, extortionary co-conspirator accounts. One of the reasons they bring in somebody else is because they're trying to twist his arm for that person to give them the information they're looking for. Uh, but I think it's a tough case for Trump, period. Uh, I think that's true. Uh, but I think uh, delay is going to be probably the most effective tactic. Just my thought. All right. Uh, our time is up. I guess we have one last question or comment, and then I guess we're done. Um, this is a comment and a question. Um, I followed uh, Mr. Trump from the very beginning um, in trying to be elected and, and the entire sequence of events and how he treats people, his comments, and especially the comments in this particular case in which he does things that don't even make a lot of sense. And part of it, I think, because of the work I do, is part of trying to look at um, disorders, psychological diagnostic disorders. And my question is, is it possible that any of that will be used or not used for either defense or prosecution in this case? I, I didn't hear all of any of what to use. Psychological disorders. Oh, Trump's psychological disorders? Getting well, I doubt the lawyers would use it without Trump's permission, and I doubt they'll get permission. <laughs>